Greetings, Christian here from Love Israel Australasia. Thank you for joining us on today's program. I'm actually excited about today's theme, very excited actually. It's not one that's taught very often and it is a very important thing. When Yeshua identified himself as I am. Once again, I'd like to welcome Dr. Baruch Corman for today's teaching and discussion. Welcome Baruch. Good afternoon, Christian. It's good to see you as well. Thank you for joining me again. Um, it's a very, very interesting theme that we'll be talking about. It's it, like I said in my introduction, it's, it's not one that's widely taught, which I think it is very important. Um, it, it's, it's something that I, I really believe the Lord has placed in my heart, especially over the last few weeks. And it's going to be, I'm really excited to see from a biblical perspective, your teaching, your commentary over a, a number of scriptures that we'll be looking at. Um, the majority, of course, are in the New Testament because we're really looking at when Yeshua identified himself as I am and the significance of each scripture and what it relates to and the importance behind it. However, I'd just like to kick off just with uh, Exodus 3.14. Um, this is the New King James Version that I have in front of me. I'm just going to read this scripture and if you could be so kind then to um, basically tell us the literal <clears throat> translation for this scripture. So I'm just going to read it out, Exodus 3.14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Which is a wonderful scripture, very powerful. But now I'm interested to see the literal translation. Please, Baruch. I believe almost every English translation renders it very similar to that. And the key phrase that we're speaking about is that I am. And it's in most English Bibles as the present, I am. But when we look at the Hebrew, I'm going to read this very literally. Vayomer Elohim, and God said, El Moshe to Moses. And here's the key. Eheye, Asher Eheye, which is in the future. I will be whom I will be, Vayomer Kol. And he said, thus, Tomer Livnei Israel, you shall say to the children of Israel, Eheye, I will be sent me unto you. And the reason why it's in the future is that what happened in the Exodus is simply a paradigm. It speaks about something greater, that what took place 3,500 years ago in the first Passover lays the foundation, but it's when Yeshua comes, the son of God, and this great phrase, I am, in the New Testament, it's just that in the New Testament, I am, speaks about the fulfillment, not something looking forward to, but when Messiah took on human flesh, when, when God the Father sent God the Son into the world, it is a fulfillment. So that's why it's so interesting, this change from the future to the present when Messiah was literally here in, in the flesh. Well, I mean, it's powerful enough. I've always thought the New King James is a very good translation. But when you look at the literal translation, I mean, it just adds that much more power and significance to that scripture. So thank you for that. We're going to kick it off, and I'm just going to share my screen so that everyone watching this can have access to the actual scriptures that we're going to be sharing. So the first one I would like to uh, talk about, Baruch, is John 6.35. So in John 6.35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. If you can just share your teaching and your view on this very important scripture about Yeshua identifying himself, Jesus, as the bread of life. Traditionally, within Judaism, bread is a very important concept. For example, if you include bread in what you're eating, you're, you're obligated to a much longer blessing because bread see, is seen with great significance. Bread is seen generally as provision. Uh, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, he was born in 
Bet Lechem, Lechem is bread. We say in English Bethlehem, but it literally means the house of bread. And bread is synonymous with life, with God's provision. And in this passage from John chapter 6, very key. This is when people were turning away from, from him because of some hard teachings that he gave. And it's interesting because John 6 is right before what we encounter in the next chapter about the Feast of Tabernacles signifying this Feast of Tabernacles speaks to our absolute dependence, the need to trust, to rely, to depend upon God. So when Messiah says, I am the bread of life, he is saying for life, you have to depend upon me. You have to trust me. I am God's provision to humanity so that they can find life. And as we look carefully within this context, find eternal life, not temporary life, like the manna that came down and supplied life for the wilderness, but, but this bread, him being the bread of life, gives us eternal life. Well, I mean, that's so significant and powerful. Many times, many believers, and myself included, we've read this scripture over and over again, but we just sort of like skim through it and we don't see the, the, the so much that's involved in this, this scripture alone. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll go to the next scripture, John 8.12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Here again, when we look at the term light, significantly in Judaism, we, we speak about the Torah, God's instructions, God's manner of conduct, what he expects from us. And people call the Torah, Torah or the, the light of the law. And in the same way, Yeshua is saying, in order to find God's pathway, in order to have illumination, to see things from God's perspective, I'm the only way. And I think we would all agree, until a person accepts Yeshua into their life, they are in spiritual darkness. They don't see things correctly. And once that decision is made to receive Yeshua as Savior, as the, as the Christ, as our, our, our Lord and our God, our, immediately our perspective begins to change. And notice it says just not that he's light, but he's the light of the world, meaning that, that he brings a total change in our perspective for all things, not just a few things, not just spiritual things, but every aspect. We can see things correctly so we don't live in darkness but and stumble and fall, but we live in the light where we can make godly decisions and that we can see things from his perspective and follow him. So I am the light of the world. For me, this is one of my favorite uh, of these great I am sayings. This is one of my favorites. Is there a correlation or not uh, in another scripture where it says that he has taken us out of the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom? I I, I think there's a, a very strong connection with that. Only he can do that. And, and he is truly the light of God, not just the light of the world, but the light of God that, that was sent into this world. Correct. Thank you very much. We'll have, move over to the next scripture in John, once again, 10, 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Yeah, in, in John 10, and it's such a rich chapter, uh, a couple different things are said there, but we're going to speak about the kingdom of God. In fact, Yeshua as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that term Messiah, one of the ways that the anointed one is spoken of is the anointed king. And so when he says just what, what is mentioned here about being the door He's the way, the only way that one can enter into the kingdom of God. Again, you can't find that entrance without him being the light. And once you, you receive him, he's the way in which one and the only way that one can enter into the kingdom of God. 
And so it's so, so significant, so vital, so informing to us that he's not one of many doors. So frequently today, people talk about how there's many ways that lead into the kingdom of God. And that is such a, a false statement. There's only one way. And I think we'll come to this later on. But him being the door, without a door, you can't pass through. So exactly. he's the key to passing from this world into the kingdom of God. Exactly right. It's that exclusivity that it's only found in him, in him alone. And like you said, we'll touch on that a little bit later on. But um, Once again, John, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And I think just before I hand over to you, it's important if we can to also discuss that being a shepherd in those times was very dangerous. Um, you know, a lot of people don't have that context anymore, but we should probably also expand on that a little bit, but uh, over to you, Baruch. Yeah, you, you bring out a very good point. Uh, David uh, was a shepherd, and he testifies that he fought against lion and bear. Now, I don't know about you, Christian, but, but I've never had to fight a lion or a bear, but we shepherds were in a we very dangerous and difficult position. Correct. And beyond that, beyond that, so much of what Yeshua, in fact, I was teaching last night in a different venue, and we were mentioning how, how virtually everything that he did, everything that he said, there was a, a tie to the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, something from the Old Testament. And if you look, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 34, it speaks about the shepherds of Israel that they were using the sheep for themselves. They were exploiting the sheep. They weren't true shepherds. But he says here, I believe in, in Ezekiel 34, verse 15, and I, if I'm not mistaken, that he says, I am the shepherd. And he talks about how he is going to truly shepherd the sheep. So when he says here in John chapter 10 that, that he's the good shepherd, not just a shepherd, but the good shepherd, and that word good, we always need to remember that it's tied to the will of God. So he shepherds us. He leads us. A shepherd leads the flock. He leads us in the will of God. And so someone who's interested in God's will is going to hear his voice and follow him. So when he says, I'm the good shepherd, yes, he's a provider. By the way, tied to, to the next or to the previous uh, passage, in, in, in him being the door, realized that a shepherd, they would have a pen, but there was no door. The shepherd would, would lay, he would sleep at the entrance so that if anyone wanted to come in, a wild animal, they'd have to pass over him. If any of the sheep wanted to leave the pen, he was there to stop them. So the shepherd is the door. The shepherd has to do with totally taking responsibility for the sheep. And I'm so glad that, that we have that good shepherd that leads us in the will of God and that he takes total authority over my life. And it's only when we submit, when we hear his voice and follow him, are we going to be led by into good pastors, by that still waters, and we're going to reap the benefits of having him as our shepherd. Correct. And I think there's also that correlation with Psalm 23, which you taught not long ago. Um, you know, he, 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 the Lord is our shepherd. Um, and it also talked about pastures. And, but it always comes to mind as well, that other scripture that, you know, we are the sheep and no one can snatch, and nobody can snatch us out of his hand as well. So it's, it's a powerful thing, not just looking at people, look at shepherds these days, uh, but it, it was a very, very different thing in those days so i appreciate that those comments and that feedback john 11 uh verse 25 and 26 jesus said to her i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he may die he shall live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this just before i hand over to you i think it's i understand the context of that scripture but i think it applies to us so much now as well because he's also asking us that question, do you believe this? So I think it's a, it's a wonderful, powerful scripture, but 
I'll hand over to you, Brooke. One of, of the things that really makes me sad is when a believer is fearful of death. Because when we're fearful of death, we, we have forgotten one of his primary teachings, and it's just what's said in this passage, that he is the resurrection. And there's an inherent relationship. I say this often, but it's so important that, that people realize that whenever the concept, whenever there's a hint, a relationship in a text to the concept of resurrection, what should come into our mind is victory and kingdom, a kingdom victory. And then he not only says that he's the resurrection, but the resurrection and the life, he's come right now so that I can experience in this age, in this body, a kingdom life, that I behave differently, that I walk according to kingdom law, kingdom truth. I will experience kingdom provision. And all of these, everything that we're studying in this, this discussion, he's the source of it. When he says, I am, he's the source of it. Without him, we don't experience resurrection. Without him, we don't experience life. So in this passage, and I think everyone knows, John Levin deals with Lazarus, who, who's who's died, been in the tomb four days. And many people point out four days, someone will look at it and saying, well, after four days, the body would be in, in, in strong decay. And I'm sure that's true and such. But four is a number of the world and this message of kingdom, of resurrection, of a new life, a different life is a message for the entire world. And, and lastly, when he says, uh, you know, even though we die, and he's speaking about a physical death, I was talking to someone and they say, well, you know, this person's going to die. And the person has to be very, very sick. And I said, but we're all going to die. And when I said that to this person, the, the ex appearance uh, of his face really changed because he really wasn't thinking about his mortality that he too is going to die. The good news is, yes, this body's wearing out, but, but we're going to, even when we die, we're going to live and we're going to live a kingdom existence. So what great news for, for those who are mourning, those who are sad. Well, we need to remember there's a new life, a kingdom life, a resurrection. And once more, he's the source of it. Right. And like you, we've touched on it previously as well. I mean, that very, very popular scripture that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, of course, it's, it's, it's wonderful for uh, believers in Yeshua to have that assurance like we've discussed previously. So, wonderful scripture. John, we're still on John. Jesus said to him, John 14, verse 6, I am the one. And I think this is one of the most commonly used scriptures amongst believers but I'm so interested to see your feedback on this because maybe once again, it's something that we, we read, we do understand, but maybe there's so much more in this. When Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which I think is so important, like we touched on earlier about the exclusivity of Yeshua, the exclusivity of Yeshua that unfortunately and sadly, like you touched on, a lot of, uh, once again, uh, especially these mega churches, they, 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 there are sometimes on television, on secular shows, well, is Jesus, do you have to just believe in Jesus to be saved? And they say, well, I don't know. Or maybe there are other ways. And that is just, for me, that's blasphemous. So I'll hand over to you if you can just share a little bit on this very, very important scripture. I John chapter 14 is, is such a, a passage of comfort to us when he speaks in, in these ways that he's the, the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to focus in on a few minutes on this concept that he's the way. A, a very well-known passage in the Torah from the book of Exodus is found in Exodus chapter 33 beginning with verse 12. Now, I, I mentioned that it's, it's well known because not only is it read during the weekly Torah reading, 
but it's also read during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and also the Feast of Tabernacles as the Torah reading for these important festivals. And the context is Moses is confused because God's told him, lead the people into the land. And he says, but you haven't sent me who you're going to provide to, to help me finish the job. And all the rabbinical commentators, they understand that he's talking about Messiah, that, that one who's going to bring full redemption and the kingdom experience. Moses believes the entrance into the land of Israel is the, the final work of God. This is the, the goal. But when we look, he says, show me the way. And he mentions several times about the way. So even in the Old Testament, we see this correlation between the way and, and Messiah. So in this passage, I'm the way, the truth, and the truth. He defines the truth. He is the truth. And unfortunately today, truth is being questioned. You hear people talk about my truth and your truth and truth for this situation and truth for that culture and such, rather than a universal truth that Messiah defines. And it's only as we talked about earlier, him being the light, can we perceive truth? And when we are on the way in him, when we've experienced his truth, then the third thing life. And I go back over and over to the fact that in him, in a new covenant relationship with Messiah, our life is going to be very, very different. And finally, as we've said so frequently, he's the source of it. It's only through him are we going to have these things. Only through Yeshua that one finds life, eternal life, and kingdom life. Great. Thank you very much for that explanation. Moving on to the next scripture. Once again in John, I in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Wonderful scripture. Over to you. It, it, it is a, a, a wonderful scripture and it speaks about expectations. He expects his followers, his disciples, those who believe in him to be in him. And in this passage, he speaks about the benefits of being in him and the consequences of not being in him. And the evidence of that is what he does in our life. Now, we're not saved by performance. We're not saved by good works, but he's promising here. If we are in the vine, he's the vine. And I ask you, Christian, when you think of a vine like this, a grapevine, you know, what, what's, what's the main product that comes from a, a grapevine? Grapes. Grapes. And what do you do with grapes? You make? Wine. Wine. And wine is also such a, a rich concept in the scripture. Wine is synonymous for the most part with joy. So when we're in the vine, he's going to be a source of, of provision. We're going to be able to, to do his work. We're going to produce good fruit. And the concept, and this is something that a lot of people forget, when we're doing his will, when we're practicing what he would have us to do, that in and of itself is a great source of joy. Secondly, we see each, each time we, we gather for a, a holiday, a, a festival, a Shabbat, an important event, a family event like a wedding or a bar mitzvah or a birth of a child. We, we have what's called the Kiddush. And this is the prayer over the fruit of the vine. A, a cup that has, has grape juice, tirosh, or wine in it. And the prayer is that of sanctification. And sanctification is always connected to the will of God, the purposes of God. So here again, when he says, I am the vine, it's only through him can we be sanctified and our life is changed and we begin doing, we say good works, we begin doing his will that we're sanctified, set apart for, for his purposes. And again, this is the source of joy. 
Serving God is not something we do and it's, it's simply an obligation and I have to do it and, and this is the expectation, so I, I submit. That's not someone who's experienced obedience in their life. Obedience is, is truly a addictive uh, uh, experience. When we obey God and we, we know that we are pleasing him and we're accomplishing what, what glorifies him, we, we don't get tired of that. It is greater motivation to, to grow and, and mature and want to further serve him. So I am the, the vine, anyone who remains in me, well, it's not a, a question, we'll want to remain in him. Correct. And, and you're spot on. I mean, to serve Messiah uh, is certainly an honor and it, it certainly gives so much joy that the world definitely can't give. So... 100% in agreement. The next scripture, uh, Jesus answered in John 8, verse 58. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. And if you can just talk about the contents of this scripture uh, for people watching the program, and once again, the significance of what he says when he says, before Abraham was even born, I am. He's having a debate with, with leaders. One thing I'd like to say is that, that when we read the scriptures, we need to make a distinction between how the leaders responded to him. And perhaps not all leaders. We know there was Joseph of Arimathea. There was Nicodemus. And I'm sure there was other leaders. But, but pri primarily, the conflicts that he had was not with the Jewish people but it was with the leadership who were, were in a, a, almost a covenant agreement with Rome in order to keep their positions. And these were who he was mentioning. For example, we mentioned Ezekiel 34, the shepherds. These were the bad leaders that weren't leading the people, but exploiting them for their own benefit. So he was in contrast with them and they were challenging him. And he was saying to them, you know, you're not the sons of Abraham. Sons of Abraham, son and father, there's a close relationship. And Abraham, what he's known for is two things, and they're related. Abraham is known for being a man of faith. And his faith was, was rooted in his desires to, to achieve, to experience, to, to take hold of the promises of God. And the promise with the, or the problem with these leaders is that they didn't have the faith of Abraham. They weren't Abraham's seed, sure. and they weren't interested in the promises of God. They were looking to the things of this world. Now, when he says, before Abraham was, literally that word in the Greek is, before Abraham to be. The, the concept, anything in regard to Abraham, not just the covenant, but even before he was born, he says, I am it speaks about his divinity, his, the fact that he's eternal. Mm -hmm. One of the things that good theologians will teach is that there was never a time that Yeshua did not exist. He is eternal, not just looking forward, but also looking back. So when he says this, this is one of the strongest statements of him speaking forth his divinity. I'm amazed with how many times people say, well, you know, Yeshua never claimed to be God. Certainly he did. When he says that, that statement that you read from John 8, before Abraham uh, is to be, was, I am. Uh, you mentioned that, if I'm not mistaken, John 8, 58. Correct. What happened in the next verse? Well, in the next verse, after these leaders hearing that, because they thought he was proclaiming himself to be God, because they pick up stones to stone him. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful passage about Messiah stating very clearly he is the son of God. He is divine. He is God. They understood that. It's a shame that, that many people who call themselves disciples of, of, of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ, do not affirm his divinity. In fact, I was reading in a, an article in a, a Christian publication that, that one of the trends today 
is a, a moving away in this whole, whole faith and, and, and belief in the divinity of Messiah. And that is so, so tragic because if we're confused about who he is, a person cannot be saved and, and confused about his identity. We have to know him, identify him for who he truly is if we're going to enter into a relationship with him. Exactly. Thank you very much. The last scripture I'd like to look at is one of my favorites. And it just talks, it is such a powerful scripture. Uh, once again, I'll ask you, uh, once I read out the scripture in John 18, verse 6, if you can give us a bit of context about, you know, this was obviously before he was arrested. Um, but if you can just elaborate a little bit more, and once again, just touch on your comments about this scripture. So as Judas and the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the night, they asked if he was Jesus, and he replied, I am. And what's so important is what took place after, after this. Mm -hmm. and, and the context is that they're coming to arrest him. They come, one, one text says with, I believe, 500 men carrying clubs and, and, and spears and such torches at night. And, and think about this, 500 trained soldiers. And the, the Romans gave the Sanhedrin, the high priest and such, access to, to their soldiers. So it's these soldiers that, that went and arrested him. And what's so I find so extraordinary is that Yeshua took charge of the situation, told them, don't harm my disciples. And he really gave his own arrest orders. And as you pointed out, when they said, you know, we're seeking Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am. And that proclamation, and many times people read over this and they really don't see the significance. But, but as you know, all the people fell back just from the power, the power of him proclaiming the, the name of God. I am is, is the same root, the same verb that we get the yud hey vav hey for Jehovah God. So when, when he said that in the Greek language, they understood or they experienced the power of that name, the name of the very God. So every time, that he says, I am, he is proclaiming his divinity, proclaiming the name of God and revealing a characteristic of God, a benefit of knowing God, something that God provides. So all of these statements, but this one as well is one of the most significant ones that confirms the authority of that name and how that name is attached to Yeshua himself. And, and that's wonderful. And I think that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that the purpose for today's program and your teaching, I'm hoping that is twofold. Number one, that believers um, embrace if we've forgotten the importance of Yeshua's exclusivity, the authority of his name, um, his kingship, his lordship of how... Uh, just almighty he is and the other one as well we've touched on this in recent programs as well is that look things aren't going to get any better however believers in yeshua need to be comforted when they embrace yeshua for his kingship for his lordship and you know just trusting him you know do not fear put your trust in i am yeshua i am i'm just going to read just three very quick scriptures and this is more for people that are watching the program. And then, Baruch, I'll hand over to you for your closing comments. Or after I read each scripture, there's only three of them. You can even add your comments as I'm reading these scriptures. But we're all very familiar with them. <clears throat> Joshua 1, verse 9. I have, not have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I see that not as a request, it's a commandment. Any feedback on that, Baruch? Well, uh, again, a, a great passage of scripture. It, it speaks about truth. Don't turn to the, to the right or to the left, but be on the word of God. 
And within that context, he says, I will not uh, leave you or depart from you. He uses two words. And one word is for a, a leaving by intent. So we could say that would be maybe I'm not going to betray you, forsake you, leave you. The other word has to do with holding on to. And if you've ever picked up sand, oftentimes sand just kind of falls out between our hands. We, we don't intend for it to, but it does. And what he's saying is that's not going to happen. Not will I forsake you with intent and not by accident, not by some, some other happening, not by carelessness. No way will he ever abandon us. So it speaks so clearly about why we can have courage, why we can have assurance, because our God is faithful to his word. And not only is he faithful, but he has the power to carry out everything that he promises so we can have that assurance. Great. Thank you. The other the final two scriptures is Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Wonderful scripture as well. It, it, it truly is just the fact that, that if, if the Lord is for us, what difference does it make who's against us? Right. And again, these scriptures that you're, you're choosing just, just breeds confidence, assurance, security, peace with, within our hearts that we can trust and depend upon him and he will not let us down nor is there any reason for us to be dismayed in the things that we see. And as we talked about in a, a previous meeting, you know, there's a lot of people who are confused and fearful and, and don't have that peace of mind. It's the truth of God, the scripture of God. When we, when we look at it and understand it, it just breeds assurance, confidence, security, and not a spirit of fear, but a, a spirit of boldness within us that's right and i think a line to that is the last scripture i wanted to share and, and it's really for everyone watching this program we see so much negativity in the media not only with the pandemic but many other things as well but it, it's about having like baruch said that assurance in the science so i just want to first peter 5 7 casting all your care upon him for he cares for you and at no stage you say, only, only give me some of your cares or some of your worries or some of your burdens. He's basically telling us, cast all your care upon him, upon Messiah, for he cares for you. So in saying that, Brooke, I just want to hand over to you for some final comments on everything that we've spoke about, you know, especially as Yeshua identifying himself as I am. Well, that, that last scripture from First Peter, he cares for us. Isn't that a wonderful promise? And the idea here is that not only does he care, he, he loves us, but he'll take care of us. And, and let me, I'll, I'll wrap up with this statement. If you were to ask me, what is one of the greatest devices, tools, strategies of the enemy of Satan? And the term Satan means the adversary. He wants to bring adversity into my life. So what is his greatest tool for doing that it's the cares of this world when we focus in on the physical needs the, the cares the thoughts of this world when we are that minded satan we've entered into his his domain his area his battlegrounds that's not where we want to be we want to be like abraham we mentioned earlier he was pursuing the promises of god and it really speaks of of two approaches to life. Either I'm going to be consumed with the things of this world, the cares of this world, or I'm going to be passionate about the promises of God. When we're pursuing the promises of God, we're walking in faith. We are in that way. We're obeying the truth. We're committed to the things of God. But when our minds are turned to the cares of this world, what we will eat, what we will wear, those things that Yeshua warned us. Don't worry about that. Your heavenly father, he knows that you have need of all those things. He closes the, the, the flowers, the grass. You're much more worthy than any of those. So we should have a confidence. And, and I really believe to just summarize, 
these great passages, I am. This gives me confidence, assurance. We've mentioned those concepts uh, so frequently that, that I'm not alone, but he is with me because I've entered into a covenant with him. And he promises, Matthew 28, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Just like Joshua was told by Moses. So we can have that same promise. And we do have that same promise. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I hope that everyone watching this program has been encouraged. There is so much in just these eight or nine scriptures that we read about putting our trust in Messiah Yeshua, no matter what happens tomorrow. Um, he is the great I am. And greater is he who lives within us than the one who lives in this world. So be encouraged. Um, a couple of very quick announcements while uh, everyone's watching the program. Baruch is kindly giving us permission here in Australia. We have two books that Baruch has written, which is Our Blessed Hope and also The Coming King. The details will be right after this program. Anyone in Australia, they are limited copies. We only have limited availability, but if you write to us, in the details in the email that we'll put at the end of the program, we'll send them out to you free of charge. You can offer sale. Uh, you don't even have to worry about postage or handling. Uh, it's, it's in our hearts. We'd love just to send these books out to you. You'll be very blessed. Once again, if you haven't subscribed to the Love Israel YouTube channel, please do so. There is so much material, so many videos that Baruch has been teaching for a number of years, you will be blessed. Don't worry about the media. Don't worry about the news. Focus on God's word. Wonderful ministry here. Great teachings. It will definitely edify you and you will be blessed. So Baruch, I'd like to thank you once again for your time. Wonderful teachings. Uh, I'm certainly blessed. I was excited to hear, you know, all these teachings about Yeshua as I am. And I'd just like to thank you for your time once again. Christian, we, we appreciate you and Margarita and Vanessa and all that you do to, to further our work. And it's always, uh, I really enjoy having these discussions. And I'm going to say now that I, I hope that we'll continue to, to do more and more of these because I, I think they're very beneficial when we look at God's word and the way that, that you lead us through these discussions. So thank you for, for your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. So to everyone watching, thank you. Uh, be blessed, and we look forward to seeing you very soon.